we'll be learning everything about neonatal hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in this video it includes preterm and term neonate imaging including usg and mri findings what all are we going to learn in this video we'll learn the pathogenesis of hie risk factors clinical features that is signs and symptoms and in detail of imaging in preterm and term neonates this will include ultrasound findings and mri findings in detail with grading what should we know before imaging we should know the brain maturity whether it's preterm or term we should know the duration and severity of insult because imaging findings changes along with that and we should decide on the type of imaging and when to do the imaging coming to pathogenesis of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy there will be a vascular insult that will cause diminished blood flow to the brain which will reduce the oxygen so in cases of reduced oxygen nothing but hypoxia there will be anaerobic metabolism which takes up in the brain which will cause depletion of atp and accumulation of lactate which is a by product of anaerobic metabolism this will cause loss of cell membrane function because of damage and then there will be release of excitatory neurotransmitters in the junctions like glutamate etc now what does glutamate do glutamate which is released in the synapse will bind with nmda mediated calcium channel on the postsynaptic terminals which will cause calcium influx and that will in turn produce production of free radicals which will cause cell membrane damage and damage to the cell contents this cell damage or cell death will depend on the degree of injury greater the degree of insult there will be immediate ischemia and cell death lesser the degree of insult the cells will survive the initial insult but will later undergo programmed cell death which is known as apoptosis areas with greater glutamate content or excitatory neurotransmitter content will undergo greater damage that is like gray matter then areas with more energy demand or more metabolism or myelination will undergo greater damage so that means certain tissues are more affected to vascular insult this is known as selective vulnerability of the tissues now the insult is of two types that is if it is occurring before 36 weeks and after 36 weeks so in preterm the findings will differ and in term findings will differ the risk factors for hie is same in preterm and term neonates hence i'll discuss it as a whole antepartum risk factors are like hypotension multiple gestation or twin pregnancy antenatal infections or thyroid disorders etc during the delivery or labor that is intrapartum causes like forceps delivery breech delivery or cord prolapse can cause hypoxia and postpartum factors like respiratory distress sepsis or shock can cause hie child will present with low apgar score as soon as it is born then there will be bradycardia apnea periodic breathing hypotonia seizures and later this will progress to mental retardation or cerebral palsy coming to imaging modalities ultrasound is the screening or the first modality to be used in nicus etc ct has less prefer preference in this mri is the gold standard all these will show findings in subacute stages overall in term neonates asphyxia is divided into severe asphyxia mild moderate asphyxia which will show different imaging findings so different topics i'll discuss in preterm also in severe asphyxia it's different and in partial asphyxia there is finding like intraventricular hemorrhage and periventricular leukomalacia which is very important first we'll discuss a term neonate that is a child born after 36 weeks when severe asphyxia occurs what are the imaging findings there will be a central pattern of ischemia that is the areas which show active myelination will be damaged first such areas in a term neonate are deep gray matter areas like putamen 
वेन्ट्रोलैट्रल थलाम हिपो कैंपस डॉर्सल ब्रेन स्टेम एंड लैट्रल जेनिकुलेट न्यूक्लिया ऑल्सो इन कॉर्टेक्स देर इज पेरी रोलैंडिक कॉर्टेक्स विच मे और मे नॉट बी इन्वॉल्व इन टर्म न्योनेट इन सिवियर एस्पेक्सिया so what are the imaging modalities and findings which we'll find in such areas first we'll use the ultrasound which has low sensitivity of course but it is increased the sensitivity is increased after 7 days early findings will include diffuse cerebral edema that is ventricles appear collapsed that is obliterated and obliteration of extra axial csf spaces is also present gyral edema is present global increase in echogenicity is usually seen this is sagittal this is coronal section on ultrasound in anterior fontanel next we'll see after few days after 7 days what are the findings there will be increased echogenicity in basal ganglia and thalami which is seen if thalami is involved that shows severe ischemia there will be reduced resistive index in anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery this also shows a poor outcome in late stages when we follow up we can see atrophic changes in the brain that will be prominent ventricles and prominent extra axial csf spaces indicating permanent damage to the neurons next coming to mri in a term neonate with severe asphyxia dwi is the most important sequence since it can be used within 24 hours it is positive within 24 hours the findings will peak in 3 to 5 days of imaging later it will pseudo normalize at the end of first week so at the end of first week if diffusion is normal doesn't mean the brain is normal because it is pseudo normalized so here we can see diffusion weighted images showing hyper intensity in ventrolateral thalami and perirolandic cortex of course this has to be correlated with hypo intensity on adc maps and it should not be reported otherwise other sequences like t1 weighted image t2 weighted images which will show normal on day 1 the findings can be found on day 2 where there will be hyper intensity on both t1 and t2 weighted images in affected areas after first week t1 shortening occurs that is hyper intensity occurs in thalami and putamen and t2 shortening occurs that is hypo intensity in thalami and basal ganglia and perirolandic cortex that's all about severe asphyxia now if low grade insult occurs for a long time that is mild to moderate or partial asphyxia what are the imaging findings so prolonged asphyxia will affect few other areas so there will be brain sparing effect that is important areas like brain stem cerebellum and deep gray matter are spared in partial asphyxia and injury occurs in the watershed zones especially in parasagittal watershed zones but other watershed zones are also involved where there is dual blood supply anastomosis those are called watershed zones which show damage in partial asphyxia so important areas are spared so first we use ultrasound which has limited role of course in mri t1 and t2 are normal on day 1 diffusion weighted imaging can be used on day 1 here we can see hyper intensity or diffusion restriction in watershed zones on day 1 similarly t1 and t2 on the day 2 will show findings like cerebral edema etc we are done with the term neonate now we'll see the preterm neonate that is born before 36 weeks when severe asphyxia occurs the area involved are again thalami dorsal brain stem anterior vermis etc what areas are spared areas like perirolandic cortex 
and basal ganglia are usually spared in this because they show late myelination so in term neonate they are myelinating hence they are damaged in preterm they are not myelinating yet so they are less likely to be damaged next we'll use modalities like ultrasound and mri so what are the ultrasound findings in a preterm neonate this can be used within 48 to 72 hours there will be increased echogenicity in thalami mri will show again diffusion weighted imaging within 24 hours will be positive peaks in 3 to 5 days and the findings will pseudo normalize at the end of first week on day 2 we can see t2 weighted imaging there will be t2 prolongation that is hyper intensity in thalami on day 3 we can see t1 shortening that is again hyper intensity which will be seen up till chronic stages that means it is persisting till advanced stages of the disease next we'll move on to the most important topic that is preterm neonate partial asphyxia that is mild to moderate asphyxia lesser degree of damage for a prolonged time in a preterm neonate first important topic is intraventricular hemorrhage this is what occurs in partial asphyxia so the prevalence is inversely proportional to gestational age and birth weight that is if less gestational age and less birth weight more involvement what happens here is germinal matrix hemorrhage first we'll see what is germinal matrix and why hemorrhage occurs in the germinal matrix and not other areas germinal matrix is the lining of ventricles which is present in the preterm neonate this will later give rise to neurons and glial cells and it will involute by the time this 34 weeks so this germinal matrix the last to involute is present in chordothalamic groove what is chordothalamic groove here is the chordate nucleus and here is the thalami on sagittal section from anterior fontanelle this is the chordothalamic groove so germinal matrix is present here even in preterm neonate last to involute that's why this is the most common site for germinal matrix hemorrhage grading of intraventricular hemorrhage grade 1 there is only germinal matrix hemorrhage grade 2 there is intraventricular hemorrhage without hydrocephalus grade 3 there is with hydrocephalus and in grade 4 there is parenchymal extension of the hemorrhage that is intra parenchymal hemorrhage is also present we'll see one by one with images this is grade 1 this is sagittal and coronal sections here you can see hemorrhage only in the chordothalamic grooves that is germinal matrix hemorrhage so here we can see the hemorrhage which is hyper echoic this is grade 2 where there is intraventricular hemorrhage without hydrocephalus now grade 3 shows hydrocephalus also blood clot can be seen here that is hemorrhage present and grade 4 there is intra parenchymal hemorrhage next most important subheading will be periventricular leukomalacia this is also called as white matter injury of prematurity the reason why periventricular areas are involved is because of relative hypovascularity of white matter along the periventricular regions so that's why it undergoes hypoxia more so most importantly affected areas are the trigones and the white matter adjacent to the foramen of munro we see on ultrasound on ultrasound we can see something called as periventricular flare so you would have heard the term periventricular hyper echoic areas that is seen within 48 hours this shows congestion of the blood vessels around the periventricular region this will normalize by 2 to 4 weeks so these periventricular flares can progress to periventricular cysts in 3 to 4 weeks if the damage is persistent that will later progress to end stage periventricular leukomalacia by 6 months so on mri we can see t1 hypo intensity in periventricular white matter on t2 weighted it appears hyper intense 
What does end stage periventricular leukomalacia mean? On ultrasound MRI there are same findings. I'll show on MRI what are the findings. First one is reduced white matter volume which can appear hyper intense. There is dilated ventricles. This is permanent dilatation. There will be irregular outline of the ventricles. There can be some few persistent cysts in periventricular areas. There can be atrophy of the brain matter also. This is briefly the use of MR spectroscopy in HIE. This can be used within 24 hours just like the diffusion sequence there will be lactate elevation which shows two peaks one is immediately after damage one is 24 hours to 48 hours after damage peak will be at 1.3 ppm in 1.5 tesla machine peak can be seen in deep gray nuclei and parieto occipital lobes also in watershed zones another peak to be looked after is the glutamate peak which is at 2.3 ppm in 1.5 tesla overall the algorithm for working in hie for imaging is if a patient is suspected for hie then neurosonography or ultrasound of cranium has to be done as the first imaging modality so if it is positive then diagnosis is confirmed taken up for treatment if it is negative then further we have to go for MRI depending on the duration we can use diffusion T1, T2 any imaging sequence if it is positive again diagnosis confirmed go for treatment if it is negative we can use additional sequences like MR spectroscopy or we can go for a repeat scan after two to four days to confirm the extent and the findings so for more such teaching videos please follow our page on youtube and instagram at radiology doodles comment if you want any videos